Thank you for joining this session. We're going to be doing biology chapter 28. We're doing all four sections of 28 Animal Systems 2. The nervous system allows an animal to respond to changes in its environment. A stimulus is something in the environment that causes an organism to react. So that's a term you'll need to know. A stimulus can give the organism information through sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, or other feelings, um, such as the feeling of temperature and gravity and pressure. So these are all ways that the nervous system can sense information. And neurons are the cells that transmit information. Okay, so for example, um, the hand is touching water that's hot. So there are sensory nerves in the hand and that's sending the information to the brain and the brain is telling the muscles to move the hand out of the way because it's hot. And that's the basic idea. So the nervous system needs to have three sections. Sensory neurons take information from the environment or from other parts of the body. So in this example, Example here, we have a pin picking the skin. So sensory information um, is going from the skin through the body to the brain, which is where we have interneurons. Um, these are the neurons that process the information and decide what to do. And then the brain sends that signal out from the interneurons through motor neurons, which goes back out to the body and controls the response. In this case, uh, it's controlling muscles that are gonna make the body move. So that's the general way that nervous systems work, but the way nervous systems are set up um, are very different across the animal kingdom. So some invertebrates have simple systems, um, such as the neurons connected in what they call a nerve net for jellyfish, um, interneurons grouped into a ring-shaped nerve cord for starfish, areas with connected neurons called ganglia for some other invertebrates, and then there's some invertebrates that do have actual brains. Um, that's including arthropods and mollusks. All vertebrates, though, have a brain. And the brain um, is basically just an organized area of interneurons. The interneurons process incoming sensory information and send the signals out to the body. And vertebrate brains have several parts, including the cerebrum, which is the thinking part of the brain the cerebellum, which controls balance and coordination, the medulla oblongata, which controls how organs work, and optic lobes for seeing and olfactory lobes for smelling. Now we described that the nervous system starts with the um, sensory nerves, so it needs a way to get information in order to work. So it gets this through the sense organs. So in Vertebrates um, pretty much have the same sense organs. Eyes receive light in patterns and relay information about those patterns to the brain through the optic nerve. The brain forms the images that you see using those patterns sent through the nerves. Um, so that's eyes. Sound waves happen at many different frequencies and different species can detect different frequencies. The mouth and nose detect the presence of chemicals, and nerves send those signals to the brain, letting them know what chemicals are there, and we identify those as smells or tastes. And skin is a very important sensory organ. There's different nerves in the skin that sense pressure, temperature, physical damage, electricity, and vibrations, and all of those different signals get sent to the brain. In Invertebrate animals, as usual, things can be a little different. The sensory organs are not always as developed, um, or they might be developed differently. So for example, um, we'll look at the eyes or the analogs for eyes. Most have some sort of structure for detecting light, which helps them identify the movements of the environment around them. But there is a large range of complexity from simple cells that detect light up to complex eyes. Um, so, for example, these planarians just have what they call eye spots. These aren't eyes, they're just sets of cells that detect that there's light. And that's pretty much all they can tell is there is light or there isn't light. 
and that's it. Um, a lot of insects have compound eyes where there's many, many little simple eyes all put together, and that helps them really detect movement. Um, and uh, octopi and squids and cuttlefish have complex eyes that are probably at the same level of complexity as our eyes, but they're built completely differently. So invertebrates just have a wide variety of eyes, just like they have a wide variety of everything. Um, and there's also large differences in detection in all of the other senses. So we just looked at eyes as an example, but everything else is, can be different throughout the different phyla. Okay, our next section is movement and support, and there are a variety of ways in which animals move, uh, but they generally have some sort of skeletal system, and the skeletal system's job is to provide stiff body parts that help the animal move. But invertebrates don't have bones inside of their body like you do, so they have to have some other methods of using a skeletal system. Um, Hydrostatic skeletons are parts of the body that are filled with fluid, which creates pressure. Earthworms and jellyfish and hydra are all examples of animals that use this fluid pressure to move around. Exoskeletons are skeletons on the outside, a hard covering or shell on the outside of an animal's body. Arthropods and mollusks have exoskeletons. So if you think of um, the shell on a crab or a lobster or a mollusk, um, it's protecting the internal organs and providing support for motion. And you have the same thing on um, insects and other kind of creepy crawly arthropods. Um, there's joints in the exoskeleton that allow it to move. So the exoskeleton is covering the body and the legs of this rhinoceros beetle, but the legs have joints in it so that the legs can be bent and moved around. Now exoskeletons do have a problem. They don't grow with the animal, so they have to molt. This means they'll actually lose their exoskeleton, grow a little bigger, and gain a new one. So on the left here, we have a cicada that's leaving behind a small exoskeleton, and now it's unprotected. It doesn't really have an exoskeleton. It's going to grow a new one quickly. Endoskeletons are skeletons on the inside, like yours, and the endoskeleton does grow as the organism grows. And there's a variety of types of endoskeletons. Starfish and other echinoderms have one made of calcium plates. Sharks have an endosterm endoskeleton made of cartilage instead of bones. And um, all vertebrate animals have a skeleton that's made mostly of bone with a little bit of cartilage. Generally, the cartilage is in between the bones. Um, the places where the bones come together are joints that allows for movement, and they have cartilage between them and joint fluid between them, and that helps them move without grinding down. And then um, there's ligaments that hold the bones together at the joints. And again, the endoskeleton grows with the body, so that's that's because it's inside, so we can't really lose our endoskeleton, so it just has to grow as you get bigger. And we mentioned that the skeletons are there for movement and support, so they help with movement because the muscles attach to the skeleton to create movement. So when the muscle moves, it moves the bone, and that takes the whole appendage with it. So note um, that muscles cannot push. Muscles can only pull. Okay, so for muscles to work, if you think about it, if a muscle can only pull and that was all that happened, you would be able to move once and then you'd never be able to move again. So you'd be able to like bend your arm and then it would stay bent forever because your muscles couldn't push it back. So in order to you know make things function, the muscles have to to work in opposing groups. So to bend your arm, the um, biceps contract and that pulls the arm into a bent position. And on the back side of it is the triceps and they're relaxed in that position. And then to straighten the arm back out, the triceps contract and that pulls the rest of the arm down. So um, there's these opposing muscle groups all over the body where one side contracts and the other one relaxes and then they switch to move the thing the other way. So it's easily seen in the arms and legs, but they're everywhere. 
And there's actually a similar thing with um, invertebrates. So with vertebrates, they attach directly to the bones. With invertebrates, the muscles attach to the insides of the exoskeleton, but they still work the same way with these opposing pairs. So on this example of an insect leg, um, there's the red and the blue muscles shown here. So when the leg flexes, it's because the red, red ones are contract. And then uh, when the leg extends, it does that because the blue ones contract. So there's still the opposing pairs um, where the contraction is going to pull it in the right place. Our third section is reproduction. So first we're going to look at uh, methods of asexual reproduction. So asexual means it's not sexual. Um, there's no combination of genes from a, a male and a female. It's just ways that one individual can reproduce. So first, we're going to look at some of those. Um, some invertebrates actually just simply divide in half, and then each half grows back more body, and then there's two of them. So that's not very common in animals, but it does happen with some invertebrates. There's some that use budding, which is where an adult organism grows a miniature version on its side. So this is a hydra. Um, this is a, an animal that's uh, similar to a jellyfish. And what's happening here is these little buds are growing. And you can see they look pretty similar to the whole thing. And what will happen is this bud will break off and go floating away and become um, an entirely new organism. And it would have the exact same genes as the parent because it's just grown off of the parent's side. And there's some that use what's called parthenogenesis, which is where the females lay eggs that grow up without ever being fertilized. So again, they would be identical to the mother. So there's some benefits and problems with asexual reproduction. So the benefits would be that no mate is required. So the organism doesn't have to find a mate and deal with that, um, just can reproduce by themselves. And it can happen pretty quickly. But the big problem with asexual reproduction is there's much less genetic diversity. So the offspring are going to have the exact same genes as the parent. And this means that populations are vulnerable to environmental changes. So if there's one change that's going to harm them, it's going to harm all of them. Okay, and that's different from sexual reproduction where the genes are recombined. Um, there we go. Sexual reproduction leads to much more genetic diversity. So each parent contributes a different combination of genes to each offspring. And that way, each offspring is different from each other. And then the next generation grows up and each offspring is different from each other. And if there is a change in the environment, some might get hurt and some might be able to handle it a lot better. Many invertebrates actually use both sexual and asexual reproduction throughout their life cycle. So an example um, is jellyfish and other nadarians where they grow in a form called a polyp. Okay, so um, I'm going to start down here where the larvae settle down and they grow up into a polyp. And then the polyp uh, uses budding to create the second form called the medusa. So this polyp is growing a medusa, and then medusa breaks off and swims away. And so it's broken off from this polyp. It's genetically identical to it. It's budding, just like we talked about before. Uh, but now this medusa goes off, grows up into a full-size jellyfish. And then that's where the sexual reproduction happens, where it's got um, eggs and sperm, and those are going to recombine. And so then our tiny little baby jellyfish larva is going to have different genes than the original one because it's a combination of both of the, the two jellyfish parents. So this strategy allows um, the asexual part of it to create a lot of medusas quickly, and then the sexual reproduction part of it to allow the genetic recombination to make sure there's genetic diversity. Now with sexually reproducing animals, there's always um, eggs from the female and sperm 
sperm from the male that have to come together and combine those genes. Um, but some of them use a system where the female lays the eggs first and then the male comes and fertilizes them with sperm. That happens outside of the female's body. So it's called external fertilization. Fertilization. Um, so examples would be fish and frogs and other amphibians where they lay the eggs and then the male comes over and fertilizes them. Um, some others use the system where the eggs remain inside of the female's body and then the male deposits firm, sperm inside, which is called internal fertilization, which happens with mammals and birds and reptiles and some fish. So once the fertilization happens, there are different um, terms to describe where the eggs are going to develop. So in oviparous species, this is what we would call egg-laying species, the eggs are laid outside of the body, and that is where the embryos develop. They use the nutrients that are already in the egg. So the idea here is the female lays the eggs, and then she doesn't contribute any more nutrients. They're all packaged in the egg already. And so it goes for a while, and then a cute little baby tortoise hatches out of it. All birds are oviparous. Most reptiles are oviparous. There's um, some fish, amphibians, um, and the few mammals that lay eggs are oviparous. We're going to talk about this in a second, but um, there's echidnas and platypus actually lay eggs. So those are oviparous mammals, which is really weird. Most mammals, though, are viviparous. This is where the embryos get nutrients from their mother's body throughout development, and they're born developed to a point that they never need to be in an outside egg. Almost all mammals are viviparous, and there's some insects and fish and um, amphibians and reptiles that are viviparous, too. Okay, so this is um, an ultrasound of a human. So the baby is growing inside of the mother, and um, there's also even some fish that are that way. So this is just a drawing of a cutaway fish, but you can see there's baby fish inside. And then a mix of these two would be ovoviviparous. This is when the young develop inside of an egg, just like oviparous, but um, that egg is never laid. The leg is inside of the mother's body for protection. So the mother's body isn't feeding the young. It's just getting nutrients from the egg, but the egg is kept inside until uh, the offspring are born. Um, a little bit about development options. Some offspring, especially mammals, birds, and reptiles, um, they're born basically smaller versions of their parents. Uh, they have a lot of developing to do, but they have the same body plan and organs. Other animals are born in a larval stage that's completely different from a, adults, and they must go through um, complete metamorphosis to become adults. So um, the common examples of that would be tadpoles turning into frogs and caterpillars turning into butterflies. But there's others that go through this complete metamorphosis. Um, then there's others like grasshoppers that have incomplete metamorphosis. So this appears complete metamorphosis going from a tadpole to a frog. They look very, very different. Um, incomplete metamorphosis is when um, the young are called nymphs, and they're pretty similar to adults, but they're missing some features. So the example in your book is grasshoppers um, that have almost all the same features as the adults, but not quite. So as they grow and molt their exoskeleton, they grow a little more like adults. Birds and reptiles lay amniotic eggs. This is going to be an important term to know. Um, so we mentioned how um, fish and amphibians often lay eggs, but um, they need to be laid in the water. Amniotic eggs are a bit different. These are eggs that um, contain nutrients for the offspring, and they contain membranes, and they're surrounded by a protective shell. And these membranes and shell uh, protect the egg from damage, protect it from drying out, and provide the nutrients um, to help it grow. Mammals specifically have three different development strategies. 
So monotremes are really rare animals. The only ones alive today are a platypus and an echidna. That's what you see on the bottom. The left is platypus, the right is an echidna. Monotremes lay amniotic eggs. Okay, so these two are the only mammals that do this, um, but just like bird or reptile's eggs, um, they're amniotic, the offspring is in the egg, but then once the eggs hatch, the mothers feed the offspring with milk, just like other mammals. Marsupial offspring are born very early in development and crawl into a pouch on the mother's abdomen. So what you're seeing on the left is a newborn kangaroo, and you can see it pretty much looks like an embryo. It clearly is not going to be able to survive on its own. It can't function. It's not fully developed. Um, but what happens is those are born that way, but then they go into the mother's pouch, latch on to where they can get milk, and they continue growing. So here's a little more familiar kangaroo with a baby in its pouch. And then even once they are developed enough to be able to walk around on their own and get out of their pouch, they still rely on the mother for milk, for nutrients, just like other mammals do. And the most common mammals are the placental mammals. This allows the offspring to develop for a long time inside of the mother because the placenta allows the mother's body to give nutrients and oxygen to the developing embryo and remove carbon dioxide and other waste from the developing embryo. And the last section is homeostasis. And we've described homeostasis several times in this course. It's the ma maintenance of stable conditions inside of an organism's body. This includes keeping the correct concentrations of solutes dissolved in blood and fluids, the correct level of water in the cells, keeping a constant temperature, keeping the right level of glucose in the bloodstream, and more. Most of your body's functions are keeping homeostasis. Um, much, of homeostasis, much of homeostasis is controlled by the endocrine system. Endocrine glands release hormones into the blood, which control the body's functions and development. Um, they do this by taking these chemical messages, these hormones, to the different organs, and then the organs respond. So basically, all of the body's systems work together to maintain homeostasis. The endocrine system sends the messages, but all of the body systems have to function to keep it going. Pathogens are um, things that cause disease, and they can disrupt homeostasis. So the immune system fights pathogens in order to get rid of them and restore homeostasis. And a big part of homeostasis is maintaining the correct body temperature. If your body gets too hot or too cold, things stop being able to function. Now, you may have heard of animals being referred to as warm-blooded or cold-blooded, but these are not accurate terms. So we use endotherm to mean an animal that can maintain an internal temperature on its own. So for example, your body is always around 98 degrees inside of the body, even if you spend most of your day in a 70-degree room. So this is because your body can maintain and conserve heat. To lose heat, you sweat, and uh, mammals and birds are all endotherms. Ectotherms is the term for animals that must rely on an outside heat source to maintain temperature. Invertebrates, fish, amphibian, and reptiles are ectotherms. Their bodies cannot create heat when they're resting, and exercise makes their muscles create some heat, but then they have no way to maintain that heat. So in order to stay warm, they must absorb heat energy from the environment. So that brings us to the end of this chapter. Um, for more help, you can call us or you can email us, but definitely let us know if you have any questions.